Okay, I'm here with Dr. Jay Burke. Dr. Burke is a clinical psychologist and internationally recognized expert in the child and adolescent behavior field and the founder of the Center for Electronic Addiction. Dr. Burke has 25 years experience working with children and adolescents and families. He's the author of several books, including Parents' Quick Guide to Electronic Addiction and an upcoming book, which we'll talk about code shifting, social skills for the screen age. Thank you, Dr. Burke, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for the invite, Jack. I appreciate you allowing me to speak today. Okay, well, uh, I have several questions. Uh, the first question, you offer 15 social skills group back in the state of Ohio and have been leading groups for many years. Can you share a few key keys to delivering effective social skills groups for children and adolescents in schools and mental health settings? Yeah, I think, Jack, one of the things that people that are considering attending the seminar should understand is that we're doing practical interventions. So if they're coming thinking it's going to be a bunch of theory, we're not about that. We're doing intensive experiences where they'll walk away with good ideas. Uh, after 25 years of running the groups, what I found was I wrote this new book called uh, Code Shifting Social Skills in the Screen Age. Right. And a couple of things that will be stressing is code shifting is the ability to know in different environments which skills to apply. And the screen age kids, it's way different because social skills behind the screen are really important. An example, about 35% of boys socialize through video games. Hmm don't even know the people in real life that they're socializing with. Um, kids saying stuff online different. Kids saying stuff that's mean that they wouldn't say to somebody's face. Um, so a lot of what we found is that they're losing out on the face-to-face -face social skills. Okay. They don't play outside as much anymore. And so a lot of teachers are having trouble with kids not having the basic skills to be able to say, hey, can I play, can I join this game? what to do about bullying. We talk about things like how to make friends. A harder skill is actually how to keep friends. Keeping friends is a more difficult challenge for them. And then we'll also get into understanding specific areas. For example, kids with autism that speak about only one area of interest. ADHD kids who tend to be in people's space. Kids who are depressed who tend to isolate. So we're gonna go through many of those types of aspects. But what I guarantee people is if you show up to our program, you will leave with lots of material that you can put in place the next day and say, hey, this really works. Okay. Now, you, you, uh, we've scheduled two two-day workshops in Red Deer, Alberta and Thunder Bay, Ontario this spring. Uh, the Skills Practice Oppositional and Defiant uh, Workshops. Um, can you share a few guiding principles to work effectively with oppositional kids? Yeah, so oppositional kids, Jack, are my favorite kind of kid. I know a lot of people don't like them, but I do. Yeah. And uh, as I say, they tell you stuff about yourself you never knew. Mm. Um, so what happens is that part of it is that the staff gets upset by those kids. It's We're going to work on training the staff and how to not be overreactive to them. Also, if they like you, they will do stuff for you they won't do for other people. But what's really important is understanding two things. One is that most oppositional kids have a reason behind the reason is what I call it. And what okay. that means is they're oppositional because they're depressed. They're oppositional because they have a learning disability. They're oppositional because they have a social skills deficit. So they're not waking up in the morning going, hey, I want to make your day miserable. They actually have a purpose for that. And the second thing, if people are really wanting to learn and come to the two-day workshop, and it's intensive because it's a chance to practice, is that they need the perspective of control. Now, people think I'm saying give them control. I'm not. I'm saying that they have to have some perception of control. Because if not, oppositional kids will fight you to the death just to win the game. So many of you out there, maybe you've gotten in a situation where you punish the kid, yeah. they'll take it. They're like, you know, take a day, punish me for a day. Could I go take it for two days, take my games. And avoiding power battles, 
um, and some collaborative problem solving for really some specific things that'll work. Because one thing I find is when people come to the seminar, the biggest part of the audition is thanks for information that I can use right away that's practical. Okay. Now, Dr. Berg, uh, you know, back in the day, I worked in different programs with children and adolescents and uh, with really hardcore street kids who weren't used to taking any kind of uh, direction. They weren't used to structure. We used to have uh, adhered to a lot of behavior management type programs and level systems. And next thing you know, you had to consequence them and they would, they would be flying off the handle. Uh, have, have the strategies changed since those early days that, you know, they would lead to holding and all kinds of uh, drama and offensive behaviors? And, and I know a lot of uh, mental health professionals and all teachers in alternative schools, it's a real challenge to, to get young people to follow some structure and routine, especially if it, as children, there were no guidelines or no structure. Right, so I think that's a code shifting problem. Your mom or dad or grandma, whoever you grow up with, doesn't have any structure. Then you come to school and you're like, hey, well, you want me to listen to you and things like that? And explaining to the kid that it is a code shift. Okay. Um, also understanding if you're a teacher that maybe you're not going to have control over the home, but you're going to have control over this is what we're doing here. And Jack, yes, I believe there's been changes. Number one is, I have an alternative education program in my office. We didn't mention that in the header. Okay. But I have 23 kids here today, and we do not restrain kids. Um, we're very clear on that. What we want to do is we want to be in a position where the, the child or adolescent doesn't feel like they need to get violent or aggressive. Also, some of you out there running programs, I've run residential treatment programs. The concept of behavior management that's great. I can give consequences, give rewards. That doesn't necessarily solve the piece mm -hmm. and get at the underlying problem. So what we want to do is I will do things I call 30-second interventions. There are things that you can do in a short period of time. We're going to talk about things that you can do that relate to not just punishment and rewards because some of you guys are out there that are more experienced. You know if you only do behavior management, behavior modification, the kid gets older and they're like, Okay, I'm 16, what are you gonna give me if I do this? And what we're trying to develop is the intrinsic internal drive for there is a natural consequence of good stuff that happens if you work along with them. Okay. Um, and also helping the kid develop what their future is. What's their goal? So how do we get you towards your goal? Excellent. Now now in your two day workshop uh, you created uh, a letter that went out to explain the difference between your one and two day workshop and your evaluations for your one day have been excellent. Um, I review all the workshop evaluations from, from previous attendees and uh, they really appreciate the fact that you work in the trenches. You're not just spouting off information based on theory. Right, so what I find is um, my reputation in Cleveland is uh, to take the kids that have failed out of therapy with other therapists. So most kids that I see have bombed someplace once, twice, mm. three times before they see me. Um, so there are some advantages. For example, I have them in groups. And when I run a group, sometimes hearing it from another kid is better than hearing it from me because I'm all dumb and stupid. I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. But hearing it from a peer maybe makes a difference. Number two is rapport makes a difference with them. Yeah. And I think what people like the most is that I bring in real life cases from my caseload. I'll bring in some videos of kids. We're actually going to talk about what do you do with this? What do you do when it doesn't work? Other concepts of uh, it worked for a week or two. It's not working anymore. What do we do? And one big one, Jack, that I hear yeah. a lot in Canada working for you is, hey, we're out here in the remote area. We don't have a lot of support. So we're, we're sort of it. So what do we do with the staff that we have? Because we don't have a ton of resources. Now, maybe if they're in a bigger city, they've got it, but other places they don't. So I'm going to give, you know, an ability to expand the toolkit and wheelhouse of whoever you have so that you have more bandwidth of help 
Mm -hmm. even if you don't have more people. Okay, excellent. Now, another question, I'm gonna shift gears here. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, gaming addiction is listed as a potential new disease. Now, the question is, how do you determine if a child has a problem with electronics? And if a child is exhibiting a problem with gaming, can you recommend a few solutions? Yeah, I think let's start off first with the World Health Organization did come up with a recommendation for a diagnosis of gaming disorder. Mm. Now, I believe that they missed the beat a little bit in that there's electronic addiction overall, which includes social media, other things too, but they started with the gaming. There's a lot of research right now out of South Korea, places like that, um, that are involved in sort of the research part of this. Now, if you look at the criteria from the World Health Organization, when you're looking at information that says, you know, they have problems when you turn off the games, they start losing friends, they lose other interests, they have social problems. Um, but the biggest one, and it's like any other addiction, Jack, yeah. is that they um, use despite negative consequences. That's the key variable. They use despite negative consequences. Now, I believe okay. there are people with electronic addiction, but there's also a subgroup of people that have electronic overconsumption issues that aren't quite at the level of an addiction. Um, and the games themselves are programmed to be this way. Now, for people that are listening to this, please, kind of here's where the future's going. The NBA now has eSports teams that will be coming out. There'll be eSports arena. That means you go to a place, there's big screens out there. Schools will have scholarships for eSports. Yeah. So my idea is, and in the book I wrote, it's that we're gonna work with electronics, not like an alcohol, that you're not gonna drink at all, but like an eating disorder, in that you have to learn to manage the electronics, not just take them totally out of your life. And I think that's important for people to think about in terms of the electronic use, uh, because that's where it's heading. Um, also, kids today see the future as I don't need to go to school because I'm gonna be a professional YouTuber, I'm going to be a gamer, so the world is a different place than it used to be. So uh, does your kid have a problem? There's degrees of that. Um, when kids won't get off the games, mm -hmm. when they bust up your house, uh, there's behavioral issues when they start losing their friends, and then there's an extreme degree of it too. Yeah, the landscape is certainly changing, and uh, I just read a copy of your book, Parents Quick Guide. To electronic addiction there's there's not very many books like this is that correct in the field well I think what's happening is uh, I'd like to be totally transparent is that people are writing things yeah that are based on and treatment centers are coming out that are based on drugs and mm -hmm. drug kids are different so if you're listening to this please think about yeah. this you can't just take drug treatment and say my electronic addicted kid is the, is the same thing. And so there aren't a lot of books about it written by a person who's taking perspective that's not a drug and alcohol perspective. And I okay. think uh, the other thing I'd like to mention, I don't even know if you know this, Jack, now, I have a program that I just created at a boarding school for kids with electronic overconsumption issues because sometimes they need to get out of the environment to get rid of that behavior. And that's part of the problem that's happening that they just can't break it in that environment. They're up all night, they're sleeping during the day, um, their parents are afraid to pull the plug on them. And uh, you know, it's a changing world out there. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would mention is, for people listening to this and thinking about it, these kids are natives to this environment and adults are visitors. So most of the time, the kid knows how to route around the apps the parents are putting on, the screening, the filters, they know more. And so the parents are in a place where they're having to catch up to what the kids know. Okay. Now, one final question, because I always uh, read the new books that are written by our guest presenters. I try and keep current. And I recently read several chapters of your 
I'm not sure whether it's in circulation yet. Uh, code shifting, social skills for the screen age, is that out now or is that in the midst it, of being produced? It's been in the midst of being produced. It'll be out by the end of February. And we're already getting a lot of requests from school districts and agencies to make it their curriculum. Okay, now the book includes many useful lesson plans uh, right, to here, improve social skills. The question was, uh, can you explain some of the key features of this book? Yeah, so here's the key feature. Okay. It's very exciting. It takes 25 years of experience of mine and gives you two things. One is the step-by-step -step how to run a very effective social skills group. Okay, it starts off with what goals kids have. If you came to my office, mm -hmm. it's a six-year-old walking in or a 26-year-old, they know their goal. It takes, there's a five-step process that you do in every group, very effective. The second half of the book is 100 lessons, and here's the key, mm -hmm. they're, work, they're worksheet free. Because in okay. today's world, when you pull out a worksheet with a kid today, they're like, oh. And actually, you know, in some ways, it's just, it just bogs the whole thing down. So the book has changed the way that we present in terms of it will give you an exact blueprint to use, but also it will give you lots of activities that you can use that you're not going to sit there and go, hey, fill out what is a real friend? How do I make a friend? Mm -hmm. that, that kind of info. Yeah, I think educators and mental health professionals will really appreciate the worksheets in working yeah. with their children and, and uh, adolescents. So what it is, is it's, the idea is that they will be able to take what I've given them and develop a group where our outcome studies are very good and they will see it's possible to use in a school, it can be used in a clinical setting, it can be used in a home setting, um, if they're homeschooled with other homeschool kids, but they're they're able to impact lots of different environments. Um, now, I'd like to also mention, if I could, Jack, that okay. you, know, you have a really good reputation for running programs, and I think people know that. And one of the things that I do when I present for you is, and if you all are out there thinking about, mm, should I come listen to this program or not, Okay, I've got these kids who are younger. I've got these kids who are older. One thing I do is I pull the group that's there. Mm. So I'm going to look at, all right, if I've got people working with five-year-olds, I know that. If I've got high school people there, I know that. If I've got juvenile court kids, I know that. And one thing I'd like to tell you that I'm proud of is the seminar city to city, day to day, is not the same seminar. It, the, the tenants of it are but it really does change depending on who is in the room. Right, excellent. And, and we will also give you opportunities for practice. Now, the other thing I'd like to mention is we're not gonna sit there and everybody's gonna role play and I'm gonna call on somebody and you're gonna be called on, you're gonna be like, oh, I hate this, don't call yeah. me. Um, what I'm gonna do is demonstrate myself some of these techniques and then if people feel comfortable and they want to role play it out with me or something, then that will be possible. But I will bring enough uh, video and instances, and I'm also gonna talk about what to do when you hit the bump, because the bumps will come. Oh, and yeah. the last thing I also will talk about is what to do with what I call the nay-nay people. And the nay-nay people are like, do we try this, it didn't work, that kid's just a bad kid. Uh, you're going to hit those people, and if you're listening to this video, you know what I'm talking about. You have to be able to overcome the name name people. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Burke, for taking the time out of your busy schedule, and I look forward to working with you this spring. Okay. Well, thank you, Jack, and it's always a pleasure working for a wonderful organization. Okay. Thank you. Now, Dr. Burke will be providing two-day workshops in Red Deer on April 20th and 21st of this year and in Thunder Bay, Ontario on April 23rd and 24th on the topic skills practice, working with oppositional, defiant, and angry children and adolescents. So hope to see you there. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Thank you.